delighted to be joined eight minutes late. Oh, sorry. Uh, to be uh, joined by uh, Lee, Lee, Leah, Leah, Leah Hewer Richards, a PhD student from the University of Southampton. Dr. Rachel Daly. Daly or, yeah, Daly? Daly. Daly, uh, who's a professional and practice uh, development facilitator for Dementia UK. And also Dr. Alice Griffiths, who's a senior research fellow at Leeds Beckett University as well. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, so we're going to talk about care hubs. Uh, maybe, um, sorry to rush things along because we're short on time. Um, I've introduced you all already, but uh, what I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to go around and maybe pick on you first, uh, Rachel, uh, to tell us about your research. Uh, so my research is um, was based on shared decision making for people living with dementia in care homes. So I um, observed shared decision making interactions and I also asked people to share stories about decisions that they'd made um, with care partners and that was staff and family carers. Um, and I asked them how they made the decisions themselves and what decisions were important to them in their care homes. Um, and that was looking at everyday decisions. So things like what time to go to bed, where to sit, who to be with, when to go outside. Um, so yeah, just those everyday um, decisions that, that actually seem really important in maintaining some sense of control over your daily life. And that's tricky, isn't it? Because I, I, I suppose, is there this sense of giving up control when you move into a care home? So certainly um, people's um, perception was that people that people living with dementia weren't making decisions. Um, and if you ask people, people seem to think that they hand over control as they walk in the door. But actually, I have five people, uh, sorry, 15 people living with dementia and some in quite late stages of dementia who participated in my research and, and um, I interviewed. And they make up to 20 different decisions every day um, and participate in those decisions. And that's really important to them. They really want to be part of the decision-making process. And I suppose it's, but is it decisions that control their lives or decisions over how they'll spend their day? You know, like, do you want to watch television or not? Do you want to eat from this on the menu as opposed to the decisions about, you know, the kind of bigger decisions, I, I guess. Yeah, so so in terms of the um, the decisions that I was looking at, they were the everyday decisions. Um, but interestingly, they have more control than, than perhaps you might imagine. So some care staff particularly would limit choices when they felt that a decision was overwhelming. So if they felt it was too big to make a decision about any breadth of things, then they, they would limit that down to say two or three choices that would make it easier for the person to make the decision. But sometimes they would uh, just give them a choice of absolutely everything available to them. I can see how actually, being a resident in the nursing home or care home, you might end up with more choice than you would at home because your partner, you know, if you're particularly if you've got support of a family carer uh, or husband, wife, that they wouldn't give you their choice because they just dominate over that thing and go, here you are, here's the soup I've made you for lunch when you said soup, whereas in the nursing home you might get a choice of, do you want this or that or how do you want to spend your day? I mean, maybe... I guess nursing homes, care homes can be more empowering than continuing to live in your own home, in a, but in a different way? Or am in I a di saying, am I no, no. Crap? <laughs> no, no, you're not. Um, if you, you know, when you look at when you look at the research that's available, that um, there's a lot of research out of Australia that, that's looked at people who are community dwelling and their shared decision making and also out of America. And um, sometimes p care partners can um, just make the decision for that person and that can happen in care homes too but but the staff and care partners in care homes seem to be working really hard to empower those people where possible and to give them choices yeah I, and i can understand that and, and of course what we what i always remind myself is to not assume that somebody's life prior to a diagnosis or how they lived prior to moving into a nursing home might have been quite hard and actually moving into that new residential setting might actually be an improvement on their 
life. You know, they could have had yeah. problems with damp in the building before or furniture or noisy neighbours or, you know, I don't know, various things that actually moving into a nursing home can be better. Uh, Leah, let's, can you tell us about your work? Uh, so my work is, again, looking at care homes. My background is working in care homes and I'm, I'm a carer, really. Um, but I'm looking at specifically the relationships that are developed between care workers and the people they're supporting and how these are impacted by things like faecal incontinence and fears of contamination. And it seems to be quite a big thing that in society in general, if you go to someone and say, oh, you know, I'm a carer and everyone will go, oh, that oh, must be so hard. I couldn't do that. I couldn't clean up poo. And that's the one thing that everyone will say, no, I can't do that. That's why people don't want to do the job. Um, so what I'm really interested in is if care workers are really constantly being told that that's the negative part of their job, how they internalise that and how it might potentially affect their relationship with the people with dementia they're supporting, who might have difficulty forming relationships anyway. Um, it's become particularly prominent at the moment in light of COVID because there's the additional fears of contamination and the additional stresses that are being placed on care staff. Um, I mean, there's been reports of care staff being sort of abused in the streets because they might be contaminated and they might be spreading COVID. So it's it's quite a growing area. So that I mean this is a cultural thing, isn't it? In so much as yeah. trying to improve the perception or perceived value of of carers, which has come up before. It wasn't the government was criticized with this view as to what constitutes an expert or a yeah. professional on what who can come and live in the country and that yeah. carers were undervalued in that way. And this is this is all the way from the top down to the person at the, you know, it's completely it's it's completely systemic the way we devalue carers. And the problem is that we're putting such little value on the work they do that they have no value in themselves. And that's going to directly relate to the people with dementia that are being supported by them. So there's constantly in the news that care workers have, I mean, failures in care homes and massive case reviews because things have gone wrong. But if we're constantly telling carers that what they're doing is worthless, then they're not going to take any pride in their job. And the people yeah, that are going to suffer from that. Family care is not getting financially compensated yeah. properly and things like that. And and you can imagine then that there are no massively quick or easy fixes to this. I mean, they've got some wacky ideas, you know, you introduce, I don't know, take it over under something else, you know, make it into that professional service that's been promised in, in addressing social care childlessness for yeah. so long. Is making this into another arm of the NHS that is a professional service with proper training and and proper compensation and it's very difficult know, standard uniforms you know, <laughs> if, a nurse, if a nurse or a doctor had walked into a supermarket over the last few months they were getting clapped as being yeah amazing and then when somebody who's a care grade they just don't get the same respect so. no no exactly and that's that's sort of a, a big thing that i think really impacts the way people and um, with dementia are cared for because they are I mean, research suggests that people with dementia often feel stigmatised themselves. And if the people who are supporting them are also stigmatised just because of their job role, then it's this these sort of two groups of people that really aren't aren't doing very well and and relying on each other. So be before I move on to Alice, I'm going to I'm going to try and finish this up with you. So what's what's the research showing? How what? Well, due to COVID, my research got quite severely delayed. <laughs> <laughs> And I gather you can't visit care homes right now. <laughs> no, no. So um, unfortunately, I had to spend a lot of time sort of rejigging it to try and make it social distancing friendly. And, and so I wouldn't go into care homes. So now I'm looking to start interviews with uh, care assistants shortly. Um, so I finally got ethical approval. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think um, money will make the big difference or is it it's more than just money? I think it's more than just money. It's, it's societal attitudes, it's it's just a matter of, of value that we place on people. And, and like I say, everyone says, oh, I couldn't do that. The amount of people I've said when I say I'm a carer, they look at me and go, I don't know how you could do that. And is there another part in the world that we should be inspired by? Well, I know that in um, Asia and things and places like that, I've read a lot of research coming out there that it's quite an honour to provide support and care. I, saw, I heard a BBC Radio 4 programme about people sending, not sending, but um, moving relatives to nursing homes in, I want to say Thailand, was it? 
Yeah, I think there's... Something like that, where, where it, it was, and they were getting amazing care, yeah. and it was less expensive. Yeah, so it's um, definitely a cultural thing. Um, we just got to get down into the nitty-gritty of that and try and plan something from it. Thank you, Leah. Uh, Alice, <laughs> sorry for the delay Hi. talking to you there. Um, well, well, Alice and I have met a few times before because Alice has done podcasts for us and written blogs. I can't remember, maybe not blogs. Um, tell us about your work, Alice. Um, so I guess at the moment, um, I have a secondment one day a week um, to something called Niche Leads, which stands for Nurturing Innovation in Care Home Excellence, I think. Um, so basically, it's working with a care home, so I'm based there one day a week, although not at the moment, um, to take kind of questions that staff and relatives and residents have and answer them through research. So like take things that people find difficult when they're delivering care or as a relative, what's hard or something that residents maybe struggle with and find out how can we improve the evidence to help them do that better? Or is there already evidence out there that can tell us what best practice, what best practices so they can put that into place? And if not, do the research that can help identify that. So that's that's quite a big topic as well. That's quite yeah. <laughs> and we, what was your because your PhD was on something different again, wasn't it? Yeah. So that was on um, mental health uh, problems in care in care home staff and kind of how there's huge turnover issues that we're aware of and actually could we identify kind of factors that predict mental health problems that could help people stay in employment and have less sickness due to mainly depression and anxiety um, I, and that links to your work Leah as well I guess into the, the training side of things so I mean I'm gonna bit of an idealistic question but based on your res based on your research and the outputs because of course one of the challenging things always is translating what you learn into something that works and is used I mean there are what, over over three three hundred thousand care home residents is it three hundred thousand people living in care home residents and and translating that and their run as businesses as well um which are obviously i think i'm going to defend them to some extent i say i'm sure they all set out to provide first class care whether they all or, or certainly homes for people whether they do or not is another issue and the same goes for family carers who want to do the best for the person that they live with. But what's your research? Give me a, uh, something from your research that you'd like to see, if you could wave a magic wand and get it implemented. Well, I'm gonna to come to you first, Rachel. Okay, so one of the, so what, my research was all based on best practice and what's already happening and all the good things that are already there. So things that we just need so, to be able so to- So for you, it wouldn't necessarily be what's something new, but what would you consistently like to see? Yeah, so one of, one of the things, yeah, so one of the things that I saw regularly and that I would like to see across all care homes, and actually I would imagine lots of care homes are already doing this, is how carers use multiple senses in um, enabling people to uh, share decisions. So, uh, for instance, when asking somebody if they, what they would like to drink, uh, showing them either pictures of cartons or... Um, letting them smell the drinks, showing them the colour of the drinks, um, sometimes um, plating more than one, one dinner for them if they're asking them what food they would like to eat and then actually showing it to them on the plate to see. Sometimes people with um, dementia and communication difficulties can't um, equate chicken salad or fish pie. Um, the words don't necessarily make sense to them in the same way. But if they see it on the plate and they can smell it, it helps them to choose. And I saw that in both the care homes that I worked with and um, some carers just do it as a matter of course and people don't recognise the good practice that's going on. And you'd think, I mean, it, it's so frustrating, isn't it? Because you'd think something like that would be, would be so obvious that once one facility learns about this, that the, the next that that would be replicated and copied. But I think because the structure of the way care homes are delivered as businesses in this country and the way care home manage, I mean, I think it's, it's am, I, am I right in thinking that the majority of care homes in this country are still those 
like the big old house at the end of the street that that's somebody you know it's a business <laughs> it's kind of somebody who's turned you know what i mean owner manager uh, rather hey. than part of a company i mean i'm sure they all have policies and standard things and provide care because they have to for cqc but i'd imagine it's quite hard to keep on top of what because the research is so fast and turning out output mm -hmm. so quickly keeping on top of what is the latest best practice guidance on one thing or another is quite hard is that is this is sky still a thing the social care institute of excellence is that go on Leah, you're gonna say <laughs> well, i was just thinking um I, I, in regards to what you're saying about research coming out and then implementing it i think that's a massive massive issue because care homes um, spend so much time writing their policies for one specific thing or writing their protocols for one specific thing and and then the research change what's best practice changes communicating that from the people up here to the people down here on the floor that are, are actually delivering the care is almost impossible in a way that makes sense and is practical so getting the research out is great getting the research actually to a point where it's it's practically usable is the difficult part but other industries do this quite well don't they i mean you know taking something other industries are used to implementing new standards and those being applied quite quickly i don't know if maybe we need to learn later today we're going to talk to uh, claire durham who's a, a race for dementia fellow from the jackie stewart foundation who's brought together formula one racing to see what that could learn from research and you can imagine that creating more links between other industries and yeah. care would we, there's some things we could learn about how to better pass these things down. I think we have a lot to learn from other companies and the way they work. I really do. But one of the things I think is difficult for carers is we're you could put, can't speak. Sorry. As as, right. as as we were always saying, everyone with their dementia experiences their dementia differently. So what works for one person doesn't work for another. And then you're working for a, a company that will have these blanket policies that are supposed to apply to everyone, and they don't. And I think that is a really massive difficulty for carers. And have you found it, uh, how easy or how difficult have you found it to encourage care homes to, to open their doors to research? Because I think there was this uh, concern that opening yourself up also opens yourself up to scrutiny and you might find something wrong and they're concerned you might, so it'd be easy to keep you out. Have you found that or is that? I think it's a really scary thing, but in my experience recently, people are being much more open to actually we need to learn. And, and the more, you know, we, we might be making mistakes, but it's if as long as we acknowledge those mistakes and learn from them and move on, then actually we're getting somewhere. We're not perfect at the moment. We probably never will be, but at least we're, we're trying and we're moving forward. So just, just a reminder to anybody, if you have any questions, we are going to have a minute or so at the end to put those to, um, to Alice, Leah and Rachel. If anybody has them, please post them here. Paul Brambles just reminded me that scie.org.uk does exist. So Sky is a website that still exists. And I think we'll publish <laughs> a lot of case studies and things like that on there as well, which uh, nursing homes might find. Alice, where, where, what are you going to change with your magic wand? Um, so I think um, what I'd like to change is just allowing staff to realize that they are the experts and that they do know stuff and just because they haven't got necessarily a university degree does not mean that actually they have nothing to offer because so often they're just like when we're like what 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 do you struggle with what can we help you with through research they'll be like oh well all the stuff i struggle with is practical and like that link isn't there so they just don't see themselves as experts despite having skills that most people don't have and like expertise in understanding like Leo was saying people experience dementia so differently and they're able to provide personalized care to 30 different individuals but can't try see that as like incredibly skilled and just see themselves as kind of low skilled workers who just happen to care if that makes sense. I, I completely agree and I don't think they necessarily realize that they do research every day, day in, day yeah. out, you know, when they kind of decide to just try working some, working a bit differently tomorrow, let's just try doing lunchtime half an hour earlier because everybody's getting a bit grumpy and hungry by one o'clock. Can we try and bring, the, the, that's a type of, lots more of that A-B testing research, I think is really 
quite helpful in that setting and is something mm -hmm. that they can do for themselves. I mean, it might not get written up and published in that way, but I think trying to create those communities as well where care home, it's just finding the time. I, I know when I've organized sessions for care home managers to come and get information and I think um, Adam Gordon and the research mm -hmm. network in uh, East Midlands are really amazing at, you know, kind of encouraging researchers to come and share their outputs. Just finding time though to just take an hour out of your day to go and do this is just not. People don't have the time for that, do they? They're busy people doing yeah. doing lots of other things. Martin uh, Naps has joined us. Martin's going to be talking about uh, the economics of all this soon. And <laughs> I think the whole financial aspects around care homes is an interesting question. Um, uh, we've got one point from Paul Brownbill, who was on the uh, on the show earlier today. Uh, he said he found that in his research that recognition of skills is often mm -hmm. undermined by yeah. others. We had dementia care practitioners on the wards whose activity room was often used as a storeroom, um, which just kind of shows the value of that, that they placed on that, which gives a certain impression. Yeah, or no one can find the key. That's like, so frequent. like people can't find the key to get you to get what it is that someone wants or there's no batteries and things like all there's equipment in the way yeah yeah okay well thank you very <laughs> much um to uh, rachel leah and alice we were slightly short because ftd overrun but thank you very much for joining us and talking about your work today care homes is going to come up again later today in part two when we've got uh alice somebody you we've got claire sir joining us yeah. as well and a few others as well so thank you very much all three of you for joining uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, details on all of our guests is available on the website, uh, which includes little profiles on everybody and what they work in and details of their Twitter feeds. I would encourage you to go away, um, find them on Twitter, follow them. And if you have any follow up questions, please do post them there as well. Thank you very much to you. Three. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Have a good day.